Um, some data deserves higher levels of access control, financial data, health data, medical records, passwords, and other kinds of authentication, so we know that there are varying levels of protection that are needed, but there are challenges. Some data is malware, or phishing attacks, or ransomware. Data is at risk, and we must protect it. We must improve its resilience. And finally, if we are going to demand accountability, we need international cooperation to achieve that objective. And I'll stop there, Madam Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you. May I move on to Dr. Alison Gilwald with the same question? Thank you very much. Um, so with regard to the uh, question of data justice, I think we've seen, in, particularly from a regulatory and a policy point of view, um, that um, data-related harms have largely focused on safety. Dr. Allison, could you kindly move the More? mic closer Can to you me? hear me now? Sorry about that. Um, so I think from a policy and regulatory perspective, um, we are not actually seeing just data outcomes. I think we see in policy and regulation that there's been a safeguarding of more kind of individualized notions of personal um, and individual um, uh, focuses on privacy and on um, uh, probably, possibly freedom of expression. I think COVID has highlighted the need for us to look beyond these individualized notions of privacy to more common notions of public good and public interest. Um, and I think you know, um, this needs to be done by extending our regulation to more expansive approaches um, that are needed to look um, at more at the um, governance in terms of uh, collective interest or the common good. And of course, while still preserving um, individual privacy. Um, this will not necessarily on its own produce adjust outcomes, however. What we require is moving beyond negative forms of um, uh, regulation that look mainly at breaches and extend this to more positive forms of discrimination in favor of those who are currently marginalized and would enable them and their, um, to exercise their rights and also um, would allow them to move from being simply data subjects to data producers. This will you know, require that we, uh, are, are through economic regulation, able to redress some of the existing uneven distribution of um, not only harms, but also of opportunities. And hopefully we can come back to that in terms of economic regulation. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Allison. Thank you, Mr. Eugenio. I'm sure you'll have some great perspectives to add to this. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go straight into it. And one of the challenges that I see in the data justice debate is that a lot of it has been skewed uh, in the direction of data sovereignty, which is legitimate because it takes into account uh, the enormous imbalances of power between actors in the global south and in the global north. But it's also problematic, especially when it puts uh, the national interest uh, at its core and it sort of overlooks how it might drown uh, individual sovereignty, individual agency over, over data. And maybe we, the, the extreme of this, uh, this, this polarization is internet shutdown, where the, the national interests come into the way of controlling the flows of information, but then it prevents individuals from having access to the whole internet or part of it. And uh, what I'm gonna say is that it doesn't have to be. And if we look at some of the claims uh, of, uh, um, uh, for more agency of users, uh, there are also claims about value. Users can't tap into the values that they produce. Companies can. And uh, it's not that different from the claim that governments, governments are making about the inability to tax uh, companies that refuse to have uh, their legal entities in their own countries. And uh, I, the time is not coming up as well. One point that I would like to make is it's many threads exist connecting citizens and the state. And one of the reasons why it's difficult to pursue them uh, it's also because there tends to be mistrust between the two actors. And here, if I have 10 seconds, I know it's up, uh, I want to stress the importance of regional institutions. Like the European Union has showed us how important it could be to have this institution both gaining leverage with big actors, checking on states, and protecting citizens. All right, thank you. To Mr. Tedros Besra. 
Uh, thanks very much. So I'll quickly allow me to focus on the uh, data injustice challenges that we face in the region, right? So first, I'd like to underscore the fact that data injustice actually build on pre-existing forms of injustices and inequality in society, which, of course, technology helps to reinforce and solidify, right? Be it along race, gender, or uh, socioeconomic lines. That said, three points. Number one is we face aggressive online content regulation and taxation in a number of countries. Two, excessive shutdowns, as mentioned earlier, and number three is excessive surveillance as well as issues around data privacy where, you know, uh, countries are requesting extensive personal data for people to access, you know, uh, the digital world. Thank you. Back to you. All right. Coming over to Mr. Thomas Snyder. Could you add your insights to this, sir? Yes, thank you and, and hello to everybody. Um, of course, we all know that with data you can do a lot of good things, uh, improve uh, the l lives of all us uh, people and citizens economically but also socially. But of course, you can also do bad things with data. So for us, the key question is who controls the data? Who controls my data? Who controls uh, a company's data? And in our view, um, it should be the people themselves or a company itself that should, to the extent possible, control their own data. They should be able to decide what, who they want to share it, what purpose data should be used for, and they should have a fair share of the wealth that is created with the data. It should not be the government nor big companies that control individual people's or small companies' data. In this spirit, um, in Switzerland, we have looked into what are factors to, to uh, create uh, trust in data sharing and uh, one element, a key element, is trustworthy data spaces. So we are now developing a voluntary code of conduct for everybody that is running, participating in data spaces, so that together these actors decide about the governance of the data space. And we also think it, we should have a, a, an international place, an international forum to discuss, so it's good that we have this forum here at the IGF, but then also in the long run, we need institutions on a global level where we can maybe agree on guidance on data governance in general, because this is getting more and more important. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much. I'm sure Mr. Amandeep Singh will have a lot to add to this. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of points on data justice. I think. Um, we need to move from the data protection paradigm, which is essential, which is a foundation, uh, to a data empowerment uh, paradigm, where citizens have choices over how their data is used, and where they can also share in the benefits uh, of um, innovation that builds on uh, those uh, data sets. And that's why the Secretary General has called for uh, giving uh, citizens uh, and people choices over the data in the context of the global digital compact. The second important issue for data justice uh, is addressing data poverty. Uh, so there are vast sections of the world where local communities, citizens are not building their own data sets. Uh, that those data sets are essential for solving their local problems uh, in context and therefore we need a special effort for everyone to be able to participate in the uh, data economy. And finally, something that Wint mentioned, we need international collaboration because data governance approaches are diverging in some ways like this, that some kinds of personal data, health data, financial data are more important than others. This is a notion that's well understood in the US, for instance, given its common law and law of thoughts framework, but this is not a notion that is well understood in Europe, where, you know, regardless of the kind of data, personal data has to be protected at a certain level. So these are kind of subtle differences, but sometimes in operational terms, they become important, and we need an international platform where some alignment can be done. Thanks. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Thoko Mia, the founder of Startup Thoko, could we have your insights, please? The countdown has already begun, ma'am. Good afternoon. It's uh, Toko. Thank you so much. Um, 
Yes, so in terms of dig digital data governance and protection in Africa, um, and then South Africa specifically, which is where I'm from, which is where I'll localize the answer to, I think that it's extremely important to note that there are already conventions in place. There is an already an attempt at policy at, at governance and at um, mitigation legislation. However, there hasn't been appropriate action taken towards actually implementing any of these. So whether we're looking at the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity uh, um, Governance and uh, 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 Personal Data Protection, or whether we're looking at the Malaba Convention, whether we're looking at the South African Cybersecurity Bill, which was later converted to the um, South African Cybersecurity Bill, there's still a lack of acknowledgement, there's still a lack of acceptance. And if we're going to look at personal data protection in terms of where contemporary politics, socioeconomics are, and what's actually happening in our societies, it's extremely important that we're going to not only have these on paper or in theory, but have them in practice and have them recognized by the various member states. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the members in the panel who just took their time to answer this question. So it's so obvious that we are on unanimous length uh, that collaboration and cooperation, especially deliberations, should uh, start and that would largely help in all the, um, you know, the malpractices or any uh, problems that we are facing can be dealt with. So our call certainly is to find a common ground and mechanism or a comprehensive resolve to these problems. but. To, but with the difficulty in reaching these multilateral agreements, you know, th this is what the present scenario in the global front is showing. Is, is there a common ground to introduce an international framework uh, or global standard on digital rights? Uh, what would this framework look like if your answer is affirmative? Can I head on straight to um, Mr. Vinton Surf again? This time I'm going to take my uh, headset off so I won't be so confused. I think there's an interesting beginning. Why don't we start with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and cast that into the digital universe. Then let's try to establish norms for transparency regarding what is collected, how data is used and kept. Then we can develop technical means by which users can authorize and track the access and use of their data. And then finally, I think we could establish norms for the protection of data, the use of cryptography, for example, and other kinds of access, access controls and share best practices. That's a beginning. Uh, may I move on to Her Excellency Ms. Caroline Staldena. Thank you so much. Um, a very warm welcome and good afternoon to everybody from my side. Well, as I'm a lawyer and I was working as a criminal judge, I would answer your questions, a question with uh, a very important phrase uh, for lawyers, a very important phrase. It depends what we are talking about. And I couldn't agree more uh, with Windsor uh, when he says, let's start with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or also the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, I had the honor to work at the court uh, in Strasbourg for nearly two years. And I would say there are well-established human rights. There are good ca catalogs and also institutions which are secure that they are there. And I think at least at the panel we do have consensus that the human rights uh, have to be implemented not only offline in the physical life but also online in the digital life. And that's what we uh, have to do. And there is a big need to come together and to discuss how we can implement these human rights online. Uh, and I think especially after the pandemic, when we saw that there was a big boost for the digitalization, we saw also the downside of digitalization. And it's now up to us uh, to find solutions. And I want, would like to give you one example. Let's talk about the freedom of expression, the freedom of opinion, but on the other hand, also hatred in the internet. Uh, and uh, we have to make sure that we can um, keep the yeah, sensitive balance uh, between the different human rights and it's especially sensitive when it comes uh, to online. I think we found a quite good way in Austria. We implemented uh, the Communications Platform Act and I will come back to that later because I see time is up. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you, Your Excellency. And I can't wait to connect to this conversation with Irene Khan, the UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Opinion and, Ex and Expression, uh, uh, who is joining us online. Ms. Khan. Thank you very much. Well, of course, all I can do is uh, reiterate what has been said, that well it is well recognized now that rights offline also apply online. And as such, the international human rights framework, in my view, is the common ground on which to build uh, the foundation for digital rights. And of course, all member states have signed up to these human rights uh, principles and instruments, but so have companies uh, through the UN voluntary guidelines on business and human rights. The challenge is not about legal gaps. The challenge is actually about implementation. And that's why it's very important for states to look at smart regulation. And what I mean by that is to promote innovation and connectivity while at the same time respecting the rights to expression, information, privacy, safety online, and of course, non-discrimination. It may seem like a big task, but actually within the human rights framework, there are principles of necessity, proportionality, and legitimate objective that provide the ground for making uh, restrictions while also uh, upholding human rights. So I think the human rights framework is uh, an appropriate framework to take us forward. Well, thank you, Ms. Khan. Would you like to add on to this, Mr. Viktor Smakarov? Uh, thank you. I think if I had uh, an opportunity to simply repeat what uh, Ms. Khan and the previous two speakers just said about the indivisibility of uh, human rights online and offline, that would be the best option. The second is to make two, three quick points. Uh, first of all, there is an obvious divergence of views on how human rights should be implemented in digital areas. So, to answer the question directly, uh, we are probably not heading towards a binding framework, but should focus on underlying, underlying principles. Uh, uh, second point, uh, we have tools uh, to do that. First of all, the framework for the aspiration is in the Global Digital Compact. Obviously, we now have, fortunately, uh, the UN Tech Envoy, whom we will support uh, in uh, implementing his digital agenda, including rights. Uh, third point, uh, the EU has set a high bar for itself with the EU. EU Declaration on Digital Rights and Principles. Citizens of the European Union demand that, but the EU will also, I hope, externally focus on outreach, cooperation and engagement, not only to build capacity through the global gateway strategy, but also to help shape ethical, safe and inclusive international technology standards uh, for all. And uh, my last and fourth point is that multi-stakeholder approach is critical here. We cannot discuss rights without civil society, who is the main advocate. We cannot discuss digital uh, rights without uh, the tech companies who will bear an important share of responsibility in this area. Thank you. May we now add to add another perspective to this? I would want to turn to Her Excellency Ms. Monica Mutsvangwa. Thank you very much, facilitator, and I want to salute my uh, fellow panelists, and I've been listening carefully. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the organizers for inviting us. I'm a minister from Zimbabwe, minister of information, and uh, clearly what is being said here is very important. As countries who are in, in step with the fourth industrial revolution, we have embraced digitalization, and uh, clearly digitalization is the way to go. Uh, the question which, we, which I was asked was about the framework of global standard of digital rights. And yes, I agree, there are numerous policy conversations which are around digital rights through various forms, such as ITU, uh, Internet Governance Forum, like here, African Union, and even SADC. This is because digital rights, uh, they carry a similar weight of importance as uh, that of the human rights in the digital age. And it is important that all governments embrace this. And uh, my government is actually creating that environment to make sure that we are inclusive, we bring on board everybody. The predominant uh, conversation across these and other multilateral platforms has been about cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, digital infrastructure, data protection, electronic commerce, 
is just to mention just but a few. The digital rights discourse involves a lot of players, like you said, and uh, from government, infrastructure providers, data subjects, civil society, even among others. Uh, however, there's need for that broad-based consensus among those multiplayers, multilateral players, to find common points of convergency to treat the issue of digital rights as a human rights issue. Thank you, Your Excellency. May I now turn to Mr. Benjamin Bracker for his response. Yes, thank you very much, Facilitator. First of all, let me thank the IGF and Ethiopia actually for hosting uh, this event right here in Ethiopia because I think it is so important that we have this discussion we are having here on the panel also including the Global South because the Global South is becoming more and more important when it comes to questions around data privacy, data access, but also to data rights. So um, perhaps to touch base on what you just said, the European, European Union indeed just uh, issued a declaration on European digital rights and principles and they are focused on six aspects and that might give you perhaps a bit of a flavor and an idea what we could talk on a global scale. Um, they are putting people and their rights in the center of digital transformation, that's first. Then they're supporting solidarity and inclusion, ensuring freedom of choice online, fostering participation in the digital public space, increasing safety, security, and empowerment of individuals, and promoting the sustainable of the digital future. Now, while these might be very concrete on the EU level, we might look for a bit more of a general approach on the, on the global scale. So when it comes to me, I would like to see perhaps three aspects to be taken into account when we talk about uh, digital rights on a global scale. First of all, it should be the right to access to internet at least in certain public institutions, such as schools, for example. Second, the right to certain transparency when it comes to data usage, right to be forgotten, and the deletion of data. Very important also from a European perspective. And the last thing is the right of transparency of algorithms. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. And now to get the United Nations perspectives, may I turn to Mr. Amandeep again? Thank you. I think uh, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Firstly, we have the human rights standards, the UDHR, the core conventions, and even specialized areas like rights of human, uh, human rights defenders. Uh, so the challenge is to actually apply them, uh, to make sure that we are not confused by new terms like digital rights or digital human rights. It's at the end of the day, as the Honorable Minister said, human rights in the digital age. Now, when it comes to application, the problem is that traditionally human rights have been, uh, obligation have been addressed to states and through the states to non-state actors. And today the private sector plays a very important role, so we need to find ways to sharpen the accountability of the private sector for some of the human rights violations. And then we also need to s focus on specific areas. For instance, there is a vital role that internet access and digital tools and platforms play in the civic space. And that civic space can be restricted either because of government action or private sector actions. And we need to defend that. Also, some of the emerging technologies like metaverse, neural implants, raise new challenges for the application, the promotion and protection of human rights. So we need to rise up uh, to that challenge. And as was said, we need to do this in a multi-stakeholder manner. Thank you. Thank you, uh, the panel, for this very beautiful statement. Certainly, every little change uh, that we are living today, this day is evolving around the spaces that we work in. And I believe, and I so much agree to you, that it's the space uh, that is shifting. And if we could redefine or rearrange uh, you know, the, our working modalities and the uh, issues of rights that we're talking about vis-a-vis -vis our shifting spaces that should add impetus to uh, all, all this entire argument. Now let's touch upon the other important element of this entire debate we are having, the algorithms, which is certainly enabling us to rethink about information's data and whatnot. Now there have been initiatives um, uh, promoting the transparency of algorithms such as the trustworthy AI, yet they remain many people, they, they remain something that the public are largely unaware about this very fact. Uh, so what can the international community do to promote those initiatives 
and the recognition of digital rights in the AI domain. I turn first to Dr. Alison Gilwald. Thank you so much for that. Um, I firstly just wanted to come to the, back to the digital rights discussion, although I know you've uh, framed it in, uh, in terms of the a of AI. Ma'am, could you kindly uh, hold your mic closer, please? Can you hear me? Closer, a little closer. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to come back to the uh, digital rights, uh, specifically the declaration of digital rights that was mentioned, um, and just say that, you know, uh, while I think this is a important document, particularly with the focus on managing harms. Um, these are not the only aspects of, of rights, and although it's framed in the context of being human-centered and human rights-focused, um, in fact, the um, content of the document looks very much at um, innovation and business. Um, and so I think we really need to think about this in terms of you know, returning to that notion of data justice. Because I think what we see when we look at the um, focus on algorithmic governance only in terms of you know, accountability, transparency, and then also in terms of um, ethical design um, and human rights frameworks, is that we, um, it doesn't allow us to look at the um, continued uh, 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 um, uh, governance of these um, uh, algorithms in terms of assumptions around exactly what was the point that was made before about um, you know the offline rights actually not existing at all. So while you know, we're expecting these online rights when they uh, don't even exist um, offline, and that includes with the rule of law, makes the application very difficult. And what we're actually seeing is the perpetuation. Even with, if you have ethical frameworks, if you have human rights frameworks, they're not actually addressing the marginalization, the exclusion, the underrepresentation of people um, through these um, algorithms that are now increasingly being used for automated decision making and um, really impacting, you know, negatively and potentially discriminating against um, uh, people, marginalized people in particular. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kerewald. I am eager to hear uh, Your Excellency, Ms. Caroline Estalder's take on this. Thank you so much. Well, I think it's out of question that AI is playing in a very important role in the meantime in our society and that we still have uh, to see how we can make AI really trustworthy and also compliant with uh, human rights. And I think uh, the two key words in that respect are trust and transparency, as already uh, mentioned, um, for the acceptance and also for the sustainability. And we have to be very clear, AI can help us uh, to achieve uh, the Agenda 2030, the SDGs, may it be in the field of medicine or may it be in the field of agriculture. So what do we have to do? First of all, we have to keep human oversight. That's uh, one of the most important things. Um, algorithms should not run away from us uh, or out of our power. Uh, it should be explainable and, as again, transparent. So what can we do? That was the question. I think the first thing we can do, we can raise awareness uh, in the form of having discussions like this. Um, and on the other hand, uh, set measures in form of standards, maybe um, certificates uh, for AI products and, and uh, for the fields where it is used. So the challenge is really to implement principles. There are already recommendations. Think of the UNESCO re recommendation, but it's up to us now to implement them to make AI really trustworthy. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. I just wanted to confirm if Ms. Mazuba Hanyama is here with us. Uh, if she is there, I would so very much be pleased to connect her to this connection. Ms. Mazuba? Hi, yes, I'm here. Apologies for uh, delayed um, entry. Time zone got the better of me. Hi, my name is Mazuba Hanyama. I lead our human rights work at META across Africa, Middle East, and Turkey within the public policy team. Uh, great discussion so far. I think much of what I'm going to raise here uh, has been touched on by some of the speakers. Um, but maybe just give a little bit of an overview um, around this question. At Meta, we really believe that people who use our products should have more transparency and control around how data about them is being collected and used. And this being a core um, idea for us, we are thinking through a number of things. Firstly, being more transparent about when and how our AI systems are making decisions that impact the people who use our products. Then thinking making those decisions more explainable and interpretable, as was mentioned just now, and then informing people about the controls they have over how those decisions are made. Um, and here are some of the, sort of the tools and resources we've introduced to increase transparency in AI, 
We have an AI system and model documentation. We're exploring scaling our model and system level documentation through model cards and AI system cards. We're also looking at how we expand this model interpretability. And I can speak a little bit more to this as we continue, because I know that our time is uh, limited here. Thank you, Ms. Halima. Thank you so much. May I now turn to Mr. Thomas Snyder for your response, please. Yes, thank you. Um, when we talk about transparency and explainability of algorithms, we should just not forget that some experts that actually program uh, algorithms uh, tell us that they are not able to explain or, or to understand what they do. So we have a different uh, uh, situation here. But that does not mean that there's no way to create trust even in something that none of us really understands. It's like banking, basically, by the way. Um, so. We need to have a mix of, of measures to apply. One thing is technical standards, then we have self-regulatory regulatory guidelines from the industry itself, but we also need to have regulatory frameworks for, for, for regulators and, of course, legal frameworks. And, for instance, the EU that is about to develop a regulatory framework to regulate a market of services is one element that may uh, help. The Council of Europe, uh, on the other hand, which is not the same like the EU, for those that may not know it, it's an international organization of 46 member states, has decided to uh, negotiate a convention, a binding convention on AI, based on the principles of making the link between a human rights declaration and convention and the application. And this process is open not just to European states, but to interested countries from all over the world, because, and I'm currently the chair of, the, of this committee, because we are trying to create something that is, has a global reach so that on a global level, as many countries as possible may agree on the same principle. So we are trying to introduce or stabilize things that there should be a human in the loop. At least if you ask for it, you should have a remedy. If a decision is taken by AI, there should be a way to have recourse, even if nobody understands it. If you think it's wrong, you should be able to go against it. And things like this that are part of this process. And by the way, we have a session on this uh, tonight at 5.20 or something like that, an open forum of the Council of Europe. Thank you. I'm sure it'll be great hearing you further later, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this great sharing. It's more, uh, the emphasis more is on will and determination, of course. Uh, may I now turn to Mr. Vinton Cerf for your remarks on this matter. Here we go again. Uh, thank you very much again for the opportunity to address this question. Uh, I'm going to start out by pointing out that I'm not necessarily a machine learning expert but it never stopped me from having an opinion. Uh, the first thing I want to point out, though, is that all software ha potentially has biases in it, whether it's machine learning, artificial intelligence, or more conventional programming, so we should be aware of that. Second, for machine learning, where the learning is achieved by repetition uh, and exposure to training materials, the source material is critical to the determination of bias or its lack of bias. In order to detect the bias, you have to distinguish between unbiased results and the results that exhibit the bias. But that presupposes that we know what an unbiased model looks like. That may not be so simple to figure out. Second, the, the cases that will test for, we need cases that will test for bias. We need ways of checking to see whether a model has, is manifesting bias, so we need test cases. Transparency, that is to say explainability, is really hard if the algorithm is just a constellation of variable values in a gigantic multi-layer neural network. When someone says, why did it come up with this answer? And the answer is, look at all the numbers in the neural network. That's why it came out with this answer. This is not a very satisfying explanation. And finally, we wonder whether bias of an algorithm can be detected purely on the basis of analysis. And that only works, it would, it would be desirable, I, sorry, I see my time is up. It would be desirable if we could detect bias by analysis if it turns out that the biases are so infrequent that we can't train the algorithm to detect it using conventional methods. Sorry for going on. Thank Back you. Thank you. you so much. With this, I turn to Monsignor Lucio Adrian Ruiz. Sir. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias. 
Eh, pienso que para poder colaborar con lo que se ha dicho, quisiera analizar el problema desde la cultura, porque creo que la cuestión va más profundo que solamente desde la cuestión de la inteligencia artificial. Cuando entendemos todo lo que nos viene desde la realidad digital solamente como un aspecto técnico, instrumental, nos es imposible comprender todo lo que significa y lo que implica la cultura digital. Nosotros no estamos en una época tecnológica, estamos en una era digital. Y entonces, si nos quedamos solamente en los aspectos instrumentales, perdemos y no nos interesa, no comprendemos lo que está detrás y lo que está debajo. Por eso, desde mi punto de vista, un aspecto fundamental es la educación para poder comprender la cultura digital. Porque un usuario que conoce, entiende, reclama y produce de una manera distinta. Por lo tanto, si nosotros tuviéramos la capacidad de poder enseñar a nuestros usuarios lo que significa vivir en la cultura digital, podríamos reclamar una transparencia más natural y también los que producen podrían donar una manera de entender y realizar los servicios de la inteligencia artificial de una manera distinta. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you so much. I now move to my other question, beginning with Mr. Mandip Singhil. Uh, what, uh, what are some effective approaches uh, to empower marginalized groups, uh, like in gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, nationality, etc., in defending their digital rights? And what are we right now? I mean, where are we right now in this aspiration? I think we need a new approach that combines the risk-based uh, approach that's been taken, for instance, in the EU with regard to AI systems with a human rights-based approach. Uh, that way, we can better defend uh, the marginalized. And we need a correct understanding, as Monsignor was saying, of these technologies. For instance, algorithms by themselves are nothing. You know, it's the training data, and then the decision that they propose to humans their impact on the, the contextual situation. In the old days, software was about data is combined with code, gives you a certain output. AI is about combining the data with the output. That gives you the code, which is your algorithm, which is your model. So we can't just think of the model. We need to think of a life cycle approach to the governance of these technologies. We, because these technologies also cannot be ruled through one single instrument. We need to align the international guidance with the national or regional regulatory frameworks and the industry practices. And that has to be done in an agile way. And finally, we need to be mindful that these systems are applied in specific domains. So the health sector, for instance, has its own very traditional, very classical, but very important governance issues, principles about patient privacy, uh, no harm to patients, etc. So we need to come up with the nuanced guidance for all these domains to better protect those who are vulnerable. Thank you, sir. Thank you. May I turn to Mr. Eugenio Gagliodone now? Well, thank you. Well, my generation, I, I'm not a digital native, uh, came to, to know or was told that uh, the internet was the space where we're going, we're going to connect the margin. Uh, and celebrate diversity. And, and now we know that a lot of uh, uh, the story didn't go in that direction. So much so that we need to ask ourselves how we protect these uh, marginalized group. But I also see a risk here because if we go the normative way, uh, we risk uh, multiplying ad infinitum uh, the claims for representation of smaller and smaller units of diversity. And here my suggestion as an academic uh, is, is something that can enrich this debate uh, is uh, a conversation that academics in the Global South have been having for decades, which is the conversation about decoloniality. So decoloniality re re uh, rejects the normative, uh, is interested in what is contemporary, but is also interested in long-term trajectory. How a majority becomes a minority and then a majority again. And how can we propose new images for think about these spaces in different ways? Let's think about how the colonial powers uh, have cut communities that thought of themselves as such 
into separate minorities in different spaces. Uh, and, uh, uh, and my colleague, Ashil Mbem, for example, has written beautiful words about uh, how borders not didn't exist, but had very much less importance in pre-colonial Africa. Pre-colonial Africa was a space of flows, and values is made when these flows connect. And if we think about it, this idea is very akin to the original idea of the internet in the 1990s. So I see my timing up. I know academics don't think that the role is doing policy, which I think is, they're probably right. And policymakers uh, are too busy to read books, but I think there is a lot of potential there. It's a mind that needs to be uncovered. Thank you. Thank you, great. Um, I would want to know Mr. Tedros' thought on this. Uh, thanks very much. So let me pinpoint three or four points in this regard, right? Number one is to increase its role in promoting digital rights. And in this regard, governments would have to put in place the legislative and policy environments that, uh, you know, enable digital societies to flourish. And number two is for state actors to actually respect digital rights. And three is to ensure that the private sector players actually make known their you know, uh, content moderation policy to the public and actually implement them. And four, I see that uh, you know, internet freedom uh, advocates to actually challenge laws and practices that actually stifle uh, digital rights and digital access. Thanks, back to you. Great, may I now turn to Her Excellency Ms. Caroline S. Talter to gain her thoughts on this. Thank you so much. Well, I think um, regarding marginalized groups, the same is true as for the whole internet. There are a lot of potentials in it, but also a lot of risks. While we can empower marginalized groups a lot through the internet, think of communication without uh, any differentiation regarding the ethnic, social, religious uh, background. Um, there is also the risk, on the other hand, that um, existing social and economic inequalities could be reinforced. And, and this is what we have uh, to look at if we are talking about also these groups. We, we have to keep a close eye on facts like, yes, conspiracy theories, for example, fake news, for example. I'm just coming back from Ukraine. Uh, I was there to um, see how the situation on the ground is. We have a new dimension regarding war, and that's uh, the information war, and that's done in the internet. So I think uh, we have to be very clear that a lot of risks are in this, or women are facing a lot of violence in the internet. And I'm coming back uh, to my first answer in Austria. We implemented the Communication Platform Act. What does it mean? It means means that social media platforms have to delete hatred in the internet, uh, like also anti-Semitic uh, comments, for example, or threat within 24 hours. And if it is complicated uh, to see if it's really um, violating someone, then up to seven days. But there has to be a deletion. And while we have now the DSA and the DMA on the European level, we need also global solutions. And that's why I think that we have to come together and communicate with, with, with each other and exchange our views on that. Thank you, Your Excellency. Mr. Viktor Makarov, your take on this. Thank you. Just to compliment what already has been said, uh, I'd like to stress that, again, digital rights are basically the same universal human rights applied in the digital environment. And in this particular case, rule of law and freedom of expression have to is exist. And what does it mean? The groups have to be able to speak up. There is a positive obligation on the part of the states to protect these rights. It doesn't really help if you are allowed to speak up as a marginalized group, but then you face threats online and offline. These threats always migrate from online to offline. The state has to protect people from marginalized communities who need to make their case to the society. And second, you would need effective frameworks for combating hate speech, incitement of violence, hateful disinformation online. And again, I'd like to refer to what the EU is doing with the Digital Services Act. We are going to speak about this uh, during a panel on Wednesday on tackling disinformation without resorting to censorship. And with these frameworks, there are a couple of things. First of all, they have to be rights compliant. That's the absolute uh, precondition for this uh, to work. Second, you need to educate not just society but also the law enforcement uh, agencies to uh, apply these frameworks effectively. And lastly, this also needs resources. Any agency you will create to implement the framework, you have to have a lot of qualified people, well-paid people with skills to make it work. Thank you. Thank you. Monsignor Lucio Adrian Ruiz.
hablábamos de los derechos humanos aplicados al ámbito digital. Eh, quisiera formularlo en cuatro puntos pequeños. ¿no? Primero es el respeto a la persona, porque si la persona humana como símbolo no viene respetado, no se puede conformar la sociedad. Por lo tanto, es un derecho absoluto que debemos pasarlo a la digitalidad. La segunda es respetar las ideas, porque la persona está antes de las ideas, pero las ideas van respetadas mutuamente, lo que significa que uno debe respetar al otro y también el otro debe respetar al primero. La tercera es promover el estudio, de manera tal que comprendiendo las diferencias se puede estudiar de una manera sistemática y orgánica para poder lograr consensuar o encontrar los caminos de resolución de los problemas de las diferencias. Y el cuarto es la educación, sea en la familia que institucionalmente en las distintas instancias, porque no se nace con la capacidad innata de poder entender al otro y poder encontrar caminos de resolución. Por eso es necesario que se promuevan los caminos de la educación para poder encontrar la resolución también en los caminos digitales. Thank you, thank you, Monsignor. May I now welcome Ms. Irene Khan one more time to this conversation? Your take on this, Ms. Khan? Thank you. Um, let me um, start by saying that I would like to focus actually on the word empower, because I think your question was how do we empower marginalized groups to stand up for their rights? And we empower them in the same way that we empower them to claim their rights. It has to begin with education, and by that I mean, in this case, digital literacy. And then their voices need to be heard. Uh, that means representation, promoting civic space, making sure uh, that they're there, for example, in the internet uh, governance forum discussions too. It's not enough just to have women, but women with particular backgrounds, LGBTQI people, not just uh, gender equality, meaning uh, women's equality. And the third point I would make is investment. Investment by companies and states to support the needs that have been articulated by these groups. So not coming in and telling them what they need, but listening to them and addressing their needs. In many cases, those needs are, are actually rooted in systemic uh, problems, in structural problems of discrimination against marginalized groups. So I think we need to take a very holistic approach and not see digital rights as something that can be imposed on these people, but that they actually are empowered to tell us what the issues are and that we work in a holistic way governments, the private sector, and civil society together. Thank you, Ms. Khan. Our other panelist who's joining us online is Ms. Mazuba Hanyama. Can we have your thoughts on this, Ms. Hanyama? Thank you. Um, much has been said that I think is very important. Um, I'll maybe just pull out a few points that resonated quite a bit. Um, I think this question of representation remains an important one. Maybe even before then, I think a, a common understanding about why these barriers exist, I think is quite important. One of the panelists spoke about decoloniality and understanding the impacts would be very helpful for us. And then in addressing those and thinking about approaches, um, representation remains you know, hugely important. If particular voices aren't in the room when we think about how we develop certain tools, um, we have a problem. Uh, the issue of inclusivity also remains quite a critical issue, something that we're thinking a lot about. A lot of things have been mentioned that I think were really important for us at Meta. Investment, digital literacy, education, how we think about encompassing these in ways that make it accessible for a wider range of people. And also our understanding that our differences only enrich our ability to do our work. And so how do we take these matters seriously um, in ways that put many folks who are often at the margin in the center? Thank you. Thank you so much for your inputs. Now, uh, let's turn uh, to the other question. The people in the tech ecosystem and those watching the tech ecosystem closely would very much know this. Um, have we been, have we seen, and uh, I mean, have you been seeing an emergence of a digital colonialism? And uh, is it posing a threat to the global south? How can this be prevented if this is the case? Uh, to answer this, may I first turn to Mr. Eugenio. Thank you. Well, digital colonialism is a term that has gained more and more traction in the past few years. It's an important one uh, because it accounts for the great power imbalances between the global south and the global north. 
And it's also caution against the idea that the digital, when it's expanded, is always an opportunity. It's also exploitation. We saw it, uh, probably the best ex recent example is the Uber leaks. When we saw, for example, South African drivers that were given a promise of making middle class, and then they were found themselves worse off uh, and less protected than when they started. And uh, at the same time, digital colonialism is, might be deceiving. Because colonialism came with violence, it came with coercion, it came with guns. And uh, digital comes with opportunity, with inclusion, with bringing people in. And I don't want to sound that kind of an old Marxist, uh, but uh, the idea of imperialism has been proposed uh, as a complement, not to replace it. Uh, imperialism, as Thomas Sankara would have defined it, is uh, a process by which a center of power seeks to reinforce itself and disregard the consequences on the peripheries. Uh, and this can give us analytical tools to understand certain phenomena uh, better than we have done so far. For example, we heard before uh, the case of undersea cable. You know, in, in these years, the three largest undersea cable are going to adopt to the coast of Africa. And this is a great development. But if we look at how companies present these developments, uh, is yet again a tire trope of it's a gift to Africa. We have to help Africa. No, it's not a gift to Africa. Africa is in a position of enormous strength in these days where it can compete uh, and negotiate with different actors to advance its own ideas. Uh, and this change of narrative is important. Okay. Mr. Viktor Smakarov, uh, what are your observations on this? Thank you. Uh, honestly, I don't necessarily think that this is uh, uh, the best uh, framework for addressing the issue. To me, uh, it looks uh, like this. Uh, the big tech companies uh, will exploit pretty much everyone if they are allowed to, uh, to be uh, very uh, impolite here. Uh, in the North, they would do the same. If we didn't have the uh, GDPR in Europe, they would be abusing, using and abusing our data in the same way they do other places, so you need to regulate. In the same way, uh, they would completely ignore our pleas to uh, do something about disinformation, which is still rampant, but at least in some countries and in the EU, uh, there is a framework that puts an obligation on that. So in, I think the way forward is actually to create these regulatory frameworks, to learn from each other. We're all learning. Uh, again, not even in Europe do we have the answers to uh, these issues. We have to learn from each other. We have to support each other. Uh, we uh, need to see where there are synergies to actually make our voices heard. And I understand how uh, difficult it can be uh, if you are from a relatively uh, small country uh, to do something about it, but gang together, create a framework that is understandable, uh, learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Your Excellency, Ms. Monica Motswanga, please. Uh, thank you very much once again, and I want to say we have all agreed, and I've listened to experts we are here, that digital power sustains the bloodline of basic human needs. That is in education, in media, health, finance, management systems. So we are here, therefore, to learn from each other. This governance uh, forum really should give us that hub to establish our shared digital solidarities, uh, especially uh, for nations from the Global South. And uh, coming to what you've just said, the Global South has been playing catch up when it comes to standards and principles relating to digital rights, digital platforms, and digital technologies. So Global South have been standard takers instead of standard makers in all these respects. However, that culture of being standard takers instead of being standard makers should motivate the Global South to seek alternative strategies in the area of digital transformation. This has been noted in the way countries like China, India, and Iran have taken a leading role in this respect. I can go on as a result. China, as an emerging Global South champion, has been a leading manufacturer of competitive ICT gadgets. And uh, we have seen that uh, as a country, Zimbabwe, uh, is, uh, uh, China has become a dependable partner in our nation in ICT development front. Then there's also India, which has demonstrated to the rest of the world that it is possible for a Global South nation to run an efficient e-banking system in the media sector, the migration from analog to digital, which we are also doing, by the way, digitalization. Iran has also done the same. So we are saying here we are here 
at this annual International Governance Forum to share that uh, information. We want, uh, this means that there's room, there's room certainly for South-to-South -South cooperation in the area of digital cooperation. These innovations are relevant to our digital transformation and I uh, will continue thank you. working with everybody. Thank you, Your we Excellency. Thank, thank you. you indeed. And with this, I turn to Mr. Kumia for your quick observation on this. Thank you for that. So it just in terms of digital colonialism, it's very important to note that... Uh, could you hold your mic closer, please? Okay. First and foremost, the Global South faces different uh, contemporary political and economic uh, conditions, constraints than the Greater North, and um, this development has happened in symbiosis. So it's extremely important to note that in the Global South, the type of development and the type of innovation which is required is very often not what is supplied. And this actually leads to a vortex this black hole of information, and this is what's happening with what the, the Uber crisis mentioned earlier, which is that Uber comes along and, you know, and it's not just Uber, it's Uber, it's Netflix, it's every other sort of uh, tech unicorn that's leveraging on the digital growth happening right now, and um, introduces these uh, systems that are not um, location-specific appropriate for where the country, where the context, whether it's national, regional, holds itself. And so um, it's really important to note that w with regard to the digital colonialism, it's happening at both ends. It's happening at the end of technological skills development, infrastructure, knowledge about what technology is, and what is this rise in innovation, what is this rise in digital, as well as on the ground in terms of how do we now foster and grow a sustainable society based on the inform based on the data that we we're getting how do we keep ourselves safe how do we engage in in this processes appropriately thank you thank you so much dr alison gilwood thank you very much so it is true that the rapid datafication and the increasing generation analysis of data in society is resulting in the uneven distribution of opportunities and harms following these historical patterns of social and geographical inequality, both within and between countries, as described by data colonialism. And such harms do include the appropriation of valuable data and, uh, from communities, as well as the marginalization, misrepresentation, and even erasure of communities um, through data-driven systems. They also deny, though, Struct through structural inequalities, economic opportunities that are the legacy of colonialism and continue despite le the legal end of colonialism. So the implications of this for policy and regulation are concerning um, because the application of the concept of data col colonialism, while it does accurately describe this destructive form of governance, does not address these underlying systemic issues referred to in some of the literature around this as neocolonialism or decoloniality. Um, so he, the, the consequence of this is that historical colonialism came to an end through legal changes that have been referred to here, um, but left intact the coloniality that underpins it and leads to these inequalities. So re redressing colonialism you know, can take a number of forms, um, but none of the, as described in a lot of the data colonialism um, literature, application to governance, many of these don't necessarily deal with decoloniality and addressing these fundamental structural inequalities. And this is what is important in terms of get, um, you know, re reflecting beyond those first generation rights to those second and third generation rights that would ensure more ac equitable access um, to data, not just the legal application of first generation rights. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gilwald. And with this, I turn to uh, Ms. Mazuba Hanyama for her perspectives. Thank you. Um, I think digital colonialism is certainly something for us to contend with and to think about, um, particularly in the digital space and tech, as well as thinking about the many intersecting layers of power. We know as communities of the Global South that we are particularly vulnerable to some of these conditions and how we think about the ways to make limit speech become very important. 
In terms of prevention, um, it's probably firstly important for us to understand how this emergence of digital colonialism affects the communities that we serve. In what ways are marginalized communities experiencing this kind of colonialism? How is it showing up? How are they being impacted? Um, to help better serve how we might address this. Um, I think these are all really important questions to ask, you know, with a better understanding of what this looks like. I think we stand better chance of developing strategies to help combat what we might be seeing or ways in which folks' speech might be limited or impacted. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Benjamin Braga, what's your take on this? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, I think digitization in general has actually the potential actually to bridge colonialism or to bridge the digital divide. Um, yet when we look at the South, actually far fewer people have access to the internet and the opportunities attached to it. However, also in the North, in the north we have uh, problems with the internet because we're dealing with legacy structures and policies. So I had the pleasure to, be, to visit India a couple of weeks ago, for example, and I'm really happy that you mentioned India because they actually embrace digitalization as a concept. They are not really looking so much at the threats. They actually have the market. They are going to scale, especially financial solutions. However, on the other hand, because we just talked about digital rights, it is a challenge in India when you talk about data privacy, for example. They still know that there might be still a way to go. So what might be the solution actually to bridge the digital divide that is only up to dialogue. And that is the reason why the German government is actually currently implementing digital dialogues. So we would like to actually talk about these issues. Regulation on the one hand side, where I think the European Union is pretty good, and innovation on the other side, whereas the Global South is probably a bit better than the European Union. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bracco. I'd like to come to you again, uh, Mr. Bracco, uh, with my next question. Does, does lack of government capacity contribute to internet shutdowns during conflict times? How can capacity gaps be bridged? Yeah, my question, beginning with Mr. Bracco again. Oh, okay. Sorry, the question again. Yeah, if I may repeat <laughs> the question, does lack of government capacity contribute to internet shutdowns during conflict yeah. times? Yeah. Or, and how can capacity gaps be bridged? Yeah, the thing is, um, internet shutdowns are a severe thing, but I think it should not be left up to only governments actually to deal with internet shutdowns. We are here a multi-stakeholder forum, and it should be up to multi-stakeholders how to run the internet, how to ensure redundancy so there, there might not be like um, internet shutdowns, and if there are, it has to be dealt with in the community. I don't think, especially against the background of a very gloomy international situation, government should be solely in charge of running the internet and, it, and deciding whether or not there's be a shutdown or where resources actually sh should be allocated to. All right. Um, may I now turn to Her Excellency Monica Mutswanga with this question. Thank you very much. I totally agree with my fellow panelists. There is need to maintain connectivity and free access at all times, but uh, that has to be balanced with the right of the population to digital access and the right of the population to safety and peace. Uh, shutdowns during conflicts could be an attempt by governments across the world to prevent the use of digital platforms and social media to spread propaganda and fake news which may result in more bloodshed, loss of life, and even genocide. Of course, most governments in the South need both institutional and human capacity to deal with these digital platforms in times of conflict. But again, even where policies, laws, and regulations are in place, that needs to be, that can, be, can happen. And uh, we have also seen uh, digital rights must not culminate in the violation of other people's rights. Uh, like any other rights, digital rights must not be abused to the point of limiting other citizens from enjoying protection from the state. In the same vein, enjoyment of a particular right must not be a strain on the rights of other individuals. In summary, the function of any state is to protect ordinary citizens from unjustified acts of violence. The state has the prerogative to guarantee that maximum security to private property from political oligonism and all forms of irrational, irrationality which may take. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Ms. Tokumia, eager to hear your say on this. Just on the topic of 
internet shutdowns as global trends that cause not only legal implications, but sacrifice on the ground for those who are affected. It's actually, I, I totally agree, up to us, it's our responsibility as policymakers, um, advocates, activists, um, and the plethora of other represented bodies to actually take the stand and um, speak up and speak out against internet shutdowns to ensure that there is um, greater knowledge and, and access, but also uh, connectivity itself should be a, a human right, a human right that goes with responsibilities. It's critical that we at this point are able to engage on internet shutdowns, particularly within the African context where shutdowns have been taking place and continue to take place consistently in conflict situations. And, um, you know, it's so critical. Um, it's even more pertinent as we're having this conversation now in Ethiopia, who recently signed the peace treaties um, this three weeks back in South Africa, that we're actually going to look forward to uh, a connected and connection for all. Great, thank you. I turn to Mr. Thomas Snyder on this. Yes, thank you. I think when we talk about shutdowns or also slowdowns, we need to understand what the reasons behind it uh, are. So if it's just a technical problem or resource problem, or if uh, a government tries to stop something that is really bad, like incitement to violence, and has no other idea at that moment to shut down the internet, or whether a shutdown or a slowdown is just happening because a government wants to silence people uh, in criticizing it. And of course, if it's the latter, then this is basically unacceptable. If it's one of the first two reasons, then I think we there are better ways than shutting down the internet to find solutions. With regard to combating illegal content like incitement to violence, um, we need a media regulatory system that is able to draw the line between freedom of expression and illegal uh, content like what you have in, in at least many countries for the traditional media for decades. We now need to extend this to social media and other platforms in a way that it is clear what is their responsibility, what is the responsibility of the government, of the legal system, but also of the citizens and of the people themselves. Because we would not want neither the government nor a big tech company to tell us what is true and what is untrue. This is something that a society needs to peacefully discuss and agree on what their vision of reality is and not a government or a, a, a private company. Thank a very valid perspective. I turn to Mr. Theodros Besarat for your observation on this. Uh, thanks very much once again. I think echoing in on what was said uh, earlier, I think it's important to understand what the reasons were for shutting down services, right? If you look at the research, these uh, reasons included, you know, mass uh, demonstrations, military coups and operations, uh, school exams, religious, religious holidays, uh, and whatnot, right? So for me, the question is more of what the motive was for shutting down services as opposed to capacity, but I'm sure I'm cognizant to the fact that capacity may be an issue somewhere. Thanks. Back to you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Ms. Irene Khan, what would you add to this? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I also don't see it as an issue of a lack of technical capacity because more than half of the LDCs have actually shut down the internet or slowed it down at one point or another. So clearly they have capacity to do that. The question really is, do they have legal capacity or legal authority to do it? Shutting down the internet anytime has dramatic consequences on people's lives. But during conflicts, it can be absolutely disastrous because that is when people need access to verifiable information. Uh, governments uh, usually uh, claim the shutdown is for reasons of national security or to control uh, hate speech or false information, disinformation, misinformation. But in reality, uh, evidence, there's plenty of research there that disinformation and misinformation cannot be tackled by shutting down the internet. On the contrary, um, they seem to spike uh, during uh, when, when the internet is shut down. And so do human rights violations. Human rights violations increase uh, when there are no journalists to report, and journalists need the internet very often uh, to, to report. So I think the risks are very high, shutting down the internet, and the benefits are very limited. And that is why human rights, United Nations human rights bodies have all been very consistent in saying that internet bans are unlawful under international law, and there are 
most situ and, and a disproportionate response uh, to most other situations, even internet slowdowns. There are many other ways of dealing with this. Governments should refrain from imposing shutdown, maximize access, because at the end of the day, internet shutdowns actually undermine the digital divide that we are all committed to closing. Thank you. May I now turn to Monsignor Lucio Adrian Ruiz for his observation on this. Quisiera, quisiera nuevamente aportar Quisiera eh, nuevamente aportar de, no, me, 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 eh, quisiera aportar nuevamente desde la visión cultural, ¿no? porque retomando la idea de la utilización de lo que nos viene de la digitalidad como instrumento o la concepción como cultura digital. Pero en este caso, pasándolo a lo que sean los gobernantes, los managers, los dirigentes, en cualquier ámbito, porque la no concepción cultural hace un mal utilizo de cualquier tipo de gestión de la crisis. Porque cuando uno está en crisis, toma de lo que más profundamente tiene dentro de los propios recursos mentales ¿no? y los recursos sociales. Por lo tanto, el no tener incorporado los recursos de, de, de la digitalidad dentro de las posibilidades culturales hace que no se sepa gestionar directamente la crisis. Por eso, la formación, la educación para la gestión de la sociedad es lo que nos permite que en un momento de crisis, quien debe manejar la crisis pueda saber implementar y gobernar el proceso, no quitarlo. En este sentido, no sé si tengo dos segundos, como nosotros estamos llamando, haciendo una call to action, ¿no? justamente para que desde una visión de multi-stakeholder podamos construir todos juntos, todos los miembros de la sociedad, construir una realidad del utilizo de los medios digitales. Thank you, Monsignor. And now, uh, with permission from the panelists herein, uh, amidst this uh, very prominent uh, and distinguished panel, allow me now to connect you to the um, internet again, virtually, to Mr. Volker Tork, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, for his video message. The sharing and exchange of ideas, of thoughts and information are the spark of human interaction. They enable us to debate, to share, to grow. They enable us to express our humanity. Information and communication technologies have radically expanded our capacities to connect with each other. But we see cracks and fractures in this current system. At 22%, the level of internet use in low-income countries remains far below that of high-income countries, which are approaching universal use of some 91%. The digital divide across gender and geographic lines hinders the full potential of human connection. 2.9 billion people offline left behind, excluded from access to vital information, global discussions, and economic opportunities, unseen and unheard. Others pulled deeper into the darkness with disruptions and shutdowns of the internet, phone access and blocking of social media and messaging services. Between 2016 and 2021, the hashtag Keep It On Coalition reported 931 internet shutdowns in 74 countries. These blunt tools are not only an affront to human rights. With their disruptions to health systems, commerce and education, they also stunt development. And they occur most often during times of protests or elections, where people's ability to connect and be heard are all the more crucial. Good governance depends on inclusive and meaningful participation. Yet the ability of people's voices to be heard is threatened on many fronts in the digital space. By regulation that criminalizes critical speech, by labeling it, by labeling it as disinformation or, har or harmful. By spyware that turns a phone into an all-purpose surveillance device 
invading the privacy not only of the target, but of their family and friends by online campaigns that incite hatred, violence, and discrimination. As states regulate the online space, embedding human rights guardrails will help ensure our digital space is open, free, safe, and inclusive. Social media companies, currently overwhelmingly from the global north, need to invest sufficient resources to operate safely in every location in which they do business, expanding their language capabilities and stepping up their understanding and engagement with all the communities they serve. We need to encourage and facilitate community-driven approaches. We need to empower people to design their own digital world and support local tech ecosystems and promote transparency of company and government practices. This is a vital ingredient for a meaningful conversation about our global digital commons. We need indeed a common global commitment to build an internet where trust is not undermined by disinformation, where hatred and harassment have no place, where people can express themselves and build their communities free from fear and repression. The development of a global digital compact proposed by the United Nations Secretary General, and to be hopefully agreed in 2024, gives us all the opportunity to work together towards that goal. In human rights, we have a common unifying language to have these important and challenging conversations and to ensure the protection of all our fundamental rights in the digital space. Distinguished participants, the amazing value of the internet lies in its ability to deliver on a promise that was already envisaged by Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights almost 75 years ago, that everyone has the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. We have an opportunity to get it right and to reconnect the human community. Let's use it. From the entire panel and the members in the audience here, we extend our gratitude to Mr. Volker Turk, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, for uh, just adding, uh, simply adding to this expert thoughts on the issue that we have uh, brought up today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the panel uh, basically was trying to focus or reflect on how a basic framework can possibly be established given the diversity of governance structure and individual identities to address this very pertinent issue of uh, digital rights. And we are now heading towards the end of uh, the conversation herein. And if you thought uh, uh, 90 seconds were rapid, I have the privilege of granting each and every of our panelists uh, 30 seconds now to make your final uh, statements, beginning with Mr. Tetras. <coughs> okay, I would like to use my time savings from earlier questions to amplify some of the work we do at Africa Nenda to promote the digital rights agenda in Africa, right? So we're doing this through a number of ways. One is we advocate for universal and equal access to the internet and digital rights. And uh, two, we also uh, deploy and develop tools that enhance uh, privacy and data uh, security. We have a flagship report called uh, the State of Instant and Inclusive uh, Payment Systems Report in Africa, collaborative work with UN and the World Bank, which is very insightful and, and, and rich. And Thank visit us on our website, africanada.org. I still have time for early questions, but back to you, Shavin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, the second is scary, and uh, is it starting? And so, I think that the global South is in a position of, of strength and confidence, even if it's a, a complex and, and vague term, uh, uh, where it hasn't been in the past. We saw it at the COP27, for example. So it's not just in the digital space. I also see obstacles along the way. There are claims of uh, an increasing digital Cold War, and we have to be aware of it. But we also have to push back against it. We have to realize that innovation can't but be a combination of ideas and materialities from the south, from the east, from the west, uh, rather than falling for this simplification that will get into the way of a more inclusive digital space. Thank you, Mr. Junior. To Ms. Togomiana. 
the forum of internet governance and its openness is so important for all participants of the internet and those who will engage with it. Um, it's so important that we're able to have this firstly forum, that it remains multi-stakeholder, that it remains open, transparent, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to move towards greater digital cooperation, greater interoperability, and a, a accessible internet that is affordable and connected for all that we protect the rights of users whilst they're on this platform. There are, of course, um, dangers that come up along the way, and it's important that we not only note these, but that we provide the skills and the resources to better be able to use this for all people. Thank you. Before I turn to Mr. Benjamin Bracker, may I request Ms. Mazuba Hanyabat to give her closing remarks. 30 seconds is your time limit. Thank you so much. Mine is really to say uh, a huge appreciation for being here with other panelists and perhaps just to um, reconfirm Meta's commitment to AI transparency, our commitment to thinking through and working with marginalized groups, our commitment to inclusion and diversity, um, and similar to what has been said, I think these conversations are super important, and uh, for as long as you'll have us, we'll always be here. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Irene Khan, your closing remarks, please. Thank you. Um, I, I think we, uh, there's a lot on which we agree here, and this is a great, uh, fantastic multi-stakeholder uh, forum to agree and move forward, but I think it's extremely important that we also measure concrete progress. Uh, and that this does not only mean a nice place where we can talk about uh, what we agree on, but a place where we have to solve the problems, because digital te technology will be central to our future and to the future of the country. Thank you for such positive statements. Mr. Benjamin Bracken. Yeah, we'll keep it rather short. I think we can only do it together as community, as multi-stakeholders. And for once, the Greater North and the Global South should join forces to protect the freedom of the Internet and digital rights. Because it is not the North against the South. It is openness, it is democracy against authoritarianism and against cruel regimes. So that should be the front line. Thanks. Great. Uh, I turn to Dr. Ellis. so much. Um, so I think the real challenge for us is to um, move beyond the notion of uh, um, rights only in terms of first generation rights. I think we have to move towards looking at um, the uh, governance of these in terms of uh, issues of social justice and of economic justice. I think absolutely we have to do this at a level of global governance and I think the way to do this is to treat these global digital public goods as, as such and ensure that their realization at the national level happens through global coordination and through global frameworks that ensure that the current you know, extremely uneven distribution of both harms and opportunities um, are realized at the national level in the delivery of services and the delivery of equality um, in the digital realm for all people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over to uh, Mr. Viktor Zmakarov. Human rights are universal across the online offline divide across the regions of, of the world. We will all together have much, much more agency and uh, luck implementing human rights in digital area if we work together as one global community and not south and north and if we do it in a truly multi-stakeholder uh, way. Thank you very much Ethiopia for hosting IGF. Thank you, thank you for your great words. Uh, may I now turn to your excellency please? Uh, thank you very much. Once again, I would like to thank the organizers and thank Ethiopia for organizing such a platform with uh, experts, panelists who have been saying wonderful things. I think government together with uh, multi-stakeholders uh, should uh, cr continue to create an enabling environment for digital rights to thrive. Uh, it is important to put legislative framework uh, for these digital rights. Uh, Access to internet used by all is very important. Robust ICT and media policies, that's also very, very important. And also a relevant cyber crime prevention legislation to make sure that we protect all. That's what I think I uh, got from this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Mr. Vinton, sir, now. 
So just two points. First of all, please keep in mind that we are now operating at a scale never before accomplished. Five billion people using the net, another three billion to go. I can tell you that operating at that scale is a huge challenge to achieve the objectives that we've been talking about. Second, let's keep in mind that personal, institutional, and national responsibility and accountability are vital to preserving human rights online. Thank you so much for your great thought, moving to uh, your excellency, Ms. Caroline. Two points from my side. First of all, whenever we are talking and finding solutions regarding the challenges ahead of us, um, human rights have to be the guiding stars. Secondly, uh, it is crucial to quickly come to a common understanding of how we can uh, translate international law to new technologies. I think, thirdly, that there is a big change a chance in the Internet Governance Forum, and especially in the high-level panel, which I have the honor to be under your chairmanship, dear Wint, uh, and uh, we should uh, do it now. It's the time now and forth, but um, not lastly, this is all about nothing less than what kind of world we want to live in, so let's strengthen our forces and use our international power to do it. Well, that's a great call, Your Excellency. Turning to Mr. Mandip Singh. The internet is the closest thing we have today to uh, a global consciousness. Uh, and uh, despite all the warts, all the problems, I think we have to, uh, to continue to believe in that and uphold that. Uh, and whenever things get murky or fuzzy, I think the human rights standards are a great lodestar to guide our way forward. And just to echo what Thomas said a little while back, all the problems, we have to see them in context uh, and avoid moralizing or pros proselytizing about those and work with mutual respect and mutual accommodation to take digital cooperation forward. I couldn't have said it better, so may I turn to Monsignor? In, in um, digital uh, right, not only debe ser concebida como y promovida desde la digital divide, como acceso y extensión, sino como el respeto e integridad de cada persona. Y como el, la era digital nos, coinvolge, nos involucra a todos de una manera profunda, es importante, como todos los hemos dicho, ¿no? que los derechos digitales tengan una forma inclusiva en los derechos humanos en la era digital. Mr. Thomas Snyder. Yes, thank you. It's interesting if you drill it down to 30 seconds how similar statements become. Mine is actually also similar. That whether it's an analog or a digital world, in the end, if you want to live together peacefully, with solidarity, with a fair competition and not an unfair competition, we need to sit down, all of us, discuss and agree on shared values, discuss rules, how we treat each other to implement these values, and I'm very happy that the IGF for the digital world is one of the most important fora where voices can be heard that are not uh, uh, hearable normally elsewhere. And we're very happy that this IGF is able to feed into the Global Digital Compact, which is an important document of the UN that hopefully reflects what you've heard here in Addis. Thank you. And we couldn't have ended on a better note than this. Uh, indeed, reaping from this very distinguished panel, uh, this uh, issue that we are thinking about is more than, more than our disparities, more than differences. It's about our responsibilities, our accountability, and respecting the integrity of uh, human race, about us, each other. And uh, as the panel, uh, the, I mean, admit, or are you not, uh, commonly uh, co concede, uh, I mean, agreeing that human rights should be our lens to look at them for the present purpose. And it is the right time for inter interventions because we have come a long way now and I've learned a lot of lessons from the various natural and other disasters that have come by. And we can so much foresee the future that's before us. So it's time to come together and make the right intervention. Uh, and, and, and we believe our future will be largely characterized by the kind of digital democracy or the democratic values that we contribute to this and how we seem and weave this uh, to set the foundations um, is for the present generation to decide and let us all make our bit of contributions uh, to 
uh, towards a significant, uh, make a significant and positive contribution to this effect. With this call that I believe is a unanimous say of this panel, I take a moment to thank the entire IGF uh, 2022 uh, forum, the government of Ethiopia, the United Nations Geneva, and all the partners who have put up this very important uh, forum. Also a moment to thank each and every uh, panelist herein who have taken out their time and uh, shared their valued insights and experiences uh, before us, and especially for doing it so well. Trust me, 90 seconds is not a long time. Thank you so much for your great cooperation on this. And to the members in the audience as well, thank you so much for your valued time. And with this, I rest my microphone and call off this session here.